One concern some people have had this year is the strength of the dollar. Now, just to be real clear, if you haven't paid attention and hadn't been a concern for you, uh, the dollar has been super strong this year. Uh, it, it's just been gangbusters compared to other foreign currencies. And this contributes to some extent uh, to uh, what has been uh, in a period where people are globally fearful, uh, some inflation pressures in America. But if you compare, let's say, uh, the dollar to the euro uh, from uh, it, its peak at early in the year, um, the euro is down about 15% for the first time in a long, long, long time uh, below parity with the dollar, uh, the euro is. Uh, and, and, and yet, then further, uh, the yen is down compared to the dollar twice that. Um, all the other major currencies, whether the British pound, which is down uh, to lows not seen in more than 40 years, uh, or um, to the dollar, or Australian or uh, Canadian uh, dollars, uh, they're all down. Uh, the Australian dollar uh, down the least, but uh, tied to its strong natural resource position but all down. And so a lot of people would say, maybe this is bad for the U.S. economy. Uh, strong dollar might uh, impede exports. Uh, that the uh, strong dollar um, could cause global disruption. Uh, you, you can view that the other way, however. And I want you to think through, because people don't view this correctly usually. This falls under a subset that I say all the time that you should always think global first and your own country second, uh, if uh, you think at all. Uh, you need to recall that the U.S. economy is about 25 percent of global GDP. And so if, in fact, it were bad for the U.S. economy that the dollar was up, then it would be good for the other 75 percent that they're down. You follow the simple logic there? Uh, if it would be bad for America because it would impede our exports, then it would be good for the other 75% because it would encourage their exports. And in fact, you would say that America would benefit from by being able to get imports of things like uh, overseas natural resources and products made overseas cheaper. Now, in reality, it doesn't fully all work like that. And, and, and the reason it doesn't fully work like that is said simply that almost all big firms hedge currencies in advance so that these price swings don't really impact too much what they're importing or exporting, much less than people think. Littler firms that try to trade globally, yes, that's true, they tend to have more impact because there tends to be a lower percentage of them that hedge foreign currency, whether they're American firms or overseas. But the reality is the smaller the firm, typically the smaller, not perfectly so, but typically the smaller the percentage of foreign trade. It's the huge firms that tend to be more international and or more fully global. And so in this, we can say some things. Uh, one of them we can say that people don't want to believe, but it's true. There is no historical demonstration that you can see in the data of strong or weak dollar flipping to strong or weak non-dollar currencies having predictable impacts on the stock market. Uh, and I want you to again think about why and for similar reasons. If a strong dollar were to make the stock market go up or down on any consistent basis, it would imply that the reverse would be true, which was that the weak foreign would make the stock market do the same thing, because it's the same statement. But in fact, uh, if strong dollar were good or bad for the U.S. stock market, then it would, in theory, be that the weak currency overseas would be bad for their stock market. And yet, U.S. and non-U.S. stock markets have a very, very, very consistently high correlation to each other. 
Therefore, you know that there's no actual currency effect that impacts stock markets. Hadn't been for a very, very long time, even back through the days once upon a time, long ago, when you couldn't really hedge currencies for global business, uh, global exchange. So what I want you to see is that when people have these fears, it's fear of a false factor. And fear of a false factor is pretty much always bullish because the fear is in the marketplace. It turns out to not be true. That's a positive surprise. So I want you to think about that as you think about these fears and when you hear anyone articulate them. It's just one of those things that in a period where people have a lot of fears about a lot of other stuff, they throw a few more on top just for the kicks and giggles of it. Thank you so much for listening to me. Subscribe to the Fisher Investment YouTube channel if you like what you've seen. Click the bell to be notified as soon as we publish new videos.